Welcome to Anchors of Truth, live from the 3ABN Worship Center, Winds of War with C.A. Murray. Good afternoon, friends, and welcome once again to the 3ABN Worship Center here in Thompsonville, Illinois, Southern Illinois, if you're in the vicinity and you'd like to come by and join us for this final meeting in the series of the Winds of War, we surely do encourage you to come and spend the day with us. But if you've been tuning in from wherever you are in the world, we welcome you once again. And we have been blessed as we've discovered that Pastor Murray has not been talking about wars like World War I and the Vietnam War and whatever war your country may have had. But uh, he's talking about the war that continues to rage in our heart. This afternoon, we pray that you'll set your mind on the day when there will no longer be any kind of war. And Pastor Murray is bringing that message to us entitled, War No More. We were blessed this morning with, with the challenge of how do we win the war? Win war who or win war how? Very unique titles. But I encourage you to invite the Spirit of God to come and to speak to your hearts as we once again open our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to us. So before we introduce our speaker, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you. The blessing of the Word of God can never be estimated in the natural sense. But truly, Father, these spiritual seeds are being planted to produce in us trees and fruits for eternal life. We pray that you'll bless once again your manservant, Pastor C.A. Murray. Bring these words to life. Give us the hope and the courage that we need to not only hear, but the strength to follow and live out in our lives all that you intend for us to be. And thank you, Father, that you promise that one day there will be war no more. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And now our speaker for this afternoon, Pastor C.A. Murray. How quickly time flies. Seemed like we were just at the beginning of our soldier and together, and now we come down to the last presentation. I want to thank Pastor John for sticking by me. The brethren ran off and left me this week. Everyone had something to do. Pastor Jim is away preaching. Danny is away speaking. And um, this was one of the weeks when Pastor John was in town, and so it was good to, to have him sort of come on for me there. We've been talking about war and drawing, drawing lessons from war. Um, my sister said the other day, um, I bet you can't go through those titles without looking. And um, I assured her that I could. It was what war, when? When war, why? Why war, who? When war, how? War, no more. Very easy. But this afternoon, it's war no more. And I would invite you to turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 20, the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. And we will consider a fairly lengthy passage of Scripture, just verses 5 through 10 in Revelation 20. Gracious Father, again, we call upon you to be our teacher, to mentor us as we seek to learn from your word. We thank you already for what you have promised to do whenever we open the word of God in faith. And so fail us not. Teach us again, we do pray, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation 20, verse 5, I am reading from my New King James, and the words should be there on the screen just momentarily. The Bible says, But the rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death 
has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan is released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together, uh, rather to gather to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, before I leave this text, I want you not to get too hung up and afraid or shamed or chagrined by forever and ever, because that is not saying that they will be burning forever and ever. And one of the reasons we know that is if you jump back to verse 9, fire came down and devoured them, burned them up. Forever and ever, the quickest way to translate that is for as long as it lasts. And that is a sermon in itself that perhaps we ought to just wrestle with one day. That's a good hour's worth of Bible study. But it doesn't mean they're going to be burning forever and ever because verse 9 says they will be devoured. But they will be totally devoured. And the fire will burn as long as is necessary to do the work that needs to be done. Amen. Now I want you to close your eyes for just a moment. And I want you to think about heaven. You're thinking about heaven. Now open them up and look at me. Yeah, you're still here. <laughs> it occurs to me that when you ask someone to think about heaven, you really do them a disservice. Because eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, we don't really have a concrete idea as to what heaven is like. Because there is simply nothing to compare it to. So we are reduced to thinking about the best thing on planet Earth and making it better, and that's heaven. So if the best thing for you is ice cream, then heaven is all ice cream. I'm sure glad heaven is more than ice cream. Amen. Amen. If the best thing on Earth to you is health and freedom, and not getting up in the morning with any aches or pains. Now that's a little more of the heaven that I want to go to. <laughs> but I haven't seen, ear has not heard. We don't really know precisely what to expect. And that may be part of the excitement of the whole thing. We're going to go to a place for which there is no parallel. We've never seen it before. We certainly have never experienced it before. Likewise, if we were asked to think about a world where there is no war, that's a difficult thing for humans to imagine. I was doing a little research the other day online, and a number of historians, paleontologists, archaeologists came together, and they have determined that in the last 4,500 years of recorded human history, there have been 279 years of peace on planet Earth. 279 out of 4,500. So we've been at war a long time. I want to go to Revelation 14 for just a moment. Because there is housed in that wonderful chapter messages from the three angels. Begin at verse 6. The messages of the three angels are solemn messages. The messages of the three angels are warning messages. The messages of the three angels are final messages. They constitute the last and most urgent of the warning messages given to God's people in this truly lost and dying world. Ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake about it, we inhabit 
a lost and dying world. One of the television stations that my wife and I have begun to watch since we got the new G9 dish that 3ABN and all of the Adventist channels have moved to is a station called Al Jazeera. It's an international news station out of Doha in Qatar, or Qatar, depending on which side of the potato, potato you, you flip on. Uh, Doha, Qatar. And they have a London bureau, but being an international station, they cover international news. And we tend to watch a little of that each evening because it gives you a view of the world that we live in. And one of the things that you quickly realize when you watch Al Jazeera or any international news station is that this planet is in trouble. There's not a corner of the earth where, there, where there's not fomentation and aggravation and drama and trauma and bloodshed and war and killing and death and cheating and treachery across the globe. What must it be like to be God and daily have to watch the drama and the death and the trauma that this world is going through. Truly, this world is lost and dying. And it is very difficult for we humans, even converted Christians, to drink in the reality of the times in which we live. It seems very hard for us to maintain the readiness and close contact and connection with God that these times demand. The hour, ladies and gentlemen, is very late. And Christ is coming very soon. And yet, it seems almost impossible for God's people to focus on that and to stay focused on that. It's very easy to lose our focus and forget the times in which we find ourselves. And so that first angel gave a stirring message. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Amen? And worship him who made heaven and earth, sea, springs of waters. Fear God. Give glory. This is not a suggestion. It is a command from God. It is time to fear God, respect God, and worship him who made the heaven and the earth. And in these last days, that command is both corporate and personal. The corporate aspects stand out much clearer in the second and third angel's messages, but all three are corporate message and personal message. Make no mistake about it. These messages demand, they demand attention and response from God's people. These are not messages that you can ignore. I am so glad that when the Lord impressed Danny Shelton to start this network, he gave him the title, Three Angels Broadcasting. That's right up there with Seventh-day Adventists because it speaks a message. It's a message that comes from God. Now, there are other, there are the Trinity, Trinity Broadcasting Network and other kinds of networks, but Three Angels Broadcasting speaks a message just like Seventh-day Adventists speaks a message every time you call it. That didn't come from a man. It came from God. For indeed, Babylon has fallen, and we must come out of her. That's, that's the corporate reality, that there are systems of worship that are bankrupt. That's the reality, that every system of worship is not the same. The truth is that there are individuals who are worshiping God, but they are doing so in ways that are unacceptable to him. Now that sounds very bigoted in this pluralistic society because the world we find ourselves in today is conditioned to accept everybody and everything. I've had pastors say to me, well, that's, that's your truth. This is mine. And when last I looked, pastor, truth is truth. No, your truth and mine. 
and all 33,000 Christian denominations can't be right. Somebody's got to be wrong. Either the train is on the track or off the track. Either Sabbath is crucial and important or it's not. And I remind you, ladies and gentlemen, we serve a particular God. Amen. We're coming to that towards the end of this message. God is not a slipshod, half-hearted, do-it-any-kind-of-way God. God is very particular. And when he says one in seven, he means one in seven. And when he designates which one in seven, either he means it or he doesn't. Either it is important or it is not. If he gives you ten commandments, all ten are important. Amen? If I'm towing your car with a ten-link chain and the chain breaks at link number four, is it broken? Can I pull you? If it breaks at link number nine, is it broken? Can I pull you? Don? <laughs> if the chain is broken, it's broken. Doesn't matter what link, because in order for the chain to work, all links have got to function. And if it breaks at link number four or number one or number ten or number nine, doesn't matter. I can't pull you with a broken chain. So our God is very particular. He is very, very particular. And the truth is, everybody cannot be right. Now that's a fact, Jack. And even in this pluralistic age, everything is not okay. And everything is not acceptable to him. Now that is not, that is not a commentary on any Christian or anybody's Christianity. It is a commentary on worship systems that God have said, has said are bankrupt. They're not acceptable. Now there may be honest Christians in them. That is why the call comes, worship him in spirit and in truth. And if you're in a system that is teaching or preaching something that is unlike God, you've got to come out and follow the truth because so much of the Christian world prizes tradition over truth. The Catholic bishops went into conclave, stayed in 18 years, and in 1558 in the Council of Trent, they came out and said, tradition is equal to truth. And the Catholics accepted it, and the Protestants accepted it. And now we believe if you can do something long enough and get enough people to do it, it's got to be right. But that's not the Word of God. Tradition cannot trump truth. Doesn't matter how many people believe it, truth will always be truth. And so many people refuse to study for themselves. You know the word, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show that's self-approval. Sit down in front of the TV, open up your head and let some televangelist pour in truth. Study it for yourself. The secular world is godless and ranges from mildly intolerant or mildly tolerant to apathetic to openly hostile against the things of God. And much of the religious world, Ellen White tells us, is in a spiritual stupor. They rely on the comfort of familiarity and of tradition. And a lot of people figure, and I've heard it, if you've got a guy who has 30, 40,000 people listening to him every week, he's got to be right. I was going to say something, but it may not be kind. Let me say it this way. Everybody loves a circus. Amen? Everybody loves a show. 
But worship is not a show. Worship is an affirmation of a connection between man and God. And if you look at the Bible history, the majority has never been right. God doesn't deal with or neither is he impressed by the majority. Many don't want to know, and so they just don't know. Many don't care because the cost of caring is just a little too high and is more than they're willing to pay. I've had two pastors that I've studied with. One, the pastor of a large Methodist church. Study the Word of God together. And after we were done, he said, Murray, I got to ask you a question. How much money you make? So I told him. He said, oh. Does your church buy your car? I said, no. Oh. Does the church pay for your house? No. Oh. Did the church buy you a boat? No. He said, oh. He said, well, I'll tell you frankly. I like your doctrine, but I can't take that pay cut. Because he told me. Brian had told me, I love your message. Can't take that pay cut. He said, I'm making 92000 This is in the 80s. I get a new car every 18 months, months and give the old one to my wife. My church is paying for my house, and they just bought me a new boat. Told me it was about a 36, 40 fitter, cabin cruiser, sleep six, two screws, flying bridge. I said, wow, my church bought me a TV set. <laughs> he said, I love your message, but I can't take the pay cut. So he turned his back on God. But I did baptize his associate pastor. Amen. So some don't care because the cost of caring is a little more than they're willing to pay. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, there are some, says that there are some who are willfully ignorant. They don't know because they don't want to know. And there are some who have settled down in ignorance. I remember being on a certain Christian network before I came to 3ABN, and we were supposed to be talking about my book, and the pastor tried to embarrass me. And... Um, he read half of a text, and he sort of sat up on the chair and said, so what about that? And after I got myself composed, I said, you only read half the text. If you read the other half, your answer is in the other half of the text. And I said, anyway, how many times is that text that you're referring to in the Bible? He said, oh, hundreds. I said, no, just once. I said, do you know where it is? He couldn't think of any. I said, well, here is where it is, and here is what it means. Study to show thyself approved. So some don't know because they don't want to know. Some don't know because the cost of knowing is too high. Some don't know because they simply preach and teach what they've heard, what tradition teaches them. Ellen White says in Selective Messages, page 443, that ignorance is inexcusable. Did you know this? We are told that one of the things we're going to be judged on is the stuff that we could have known and should have known, but were too lazy to know. Mm -hmm. You could have known it, and should have known it, but you were watching gun smoke.
God knows. Bible's collecting dust on coffee tables while we're looking at our iPads, iPods, iPhones, yada, yada, yada. Ignorance is no excuse. The world must know and God's people must know and we must teach them. The warning must be sounded inside and outside of the church. You know, Dick O'Phil, Richard O'Phil, said something last month. We were at a summit together uh, with Pastor Stephen Bohr. He said something very intriguing. He said, you know, so many of us spend a wonderful Sabbath with the Lord and sit in heavenly places. And then we go home, turn on the television, and crawl right back into the gutter. Isn't that interesting? He said, spend a little more time with Jesus. Take the time to spend with Jesus. And a little less time polluting our mind with the things that the world has to offer. Spend a little more time with the Lord. Ellen White says, our Christian experience ought not to be a ceaseless round of sinnings and repenting. We wonder why so many times our Christian experience is up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. And why so many times we lose focus on the things of God. The Bible says the hour of his judgment is come. True worship is not something you just do in church. True worship is a lifestyle. True worship is a 24-7 experience that includes corporate worship. But true worship is something you do with your life. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11 says, in speaking about the times of the end, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Amen? What do you ought to live like? What do you ought to be like? What do you ought to act like? What ought you to do with your life? The tenor of the times and the lateness of the hour demand attention from God's people. Luke 21, 34 says, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. King James says, I think, unaware. In other words, God is saying, heads up, ladies and gentlemen. Be aware of the times. Don't get so concerned with the things of this life that you forget Jesus is coming soon. I was looking at um, my friend and fellow director here at 3ABN. We were all uh, so pleased. A couple of years ago, uh, I married Robert and Nadia, and now Robert and Nadia have this gorgeous little baby. He's a director here. And the, they were in the back of the, the, the church uh, this morning, and everybody's looking at the little baby, and she's such a cute little child, and she's gorgeous. Looks like Nadia, not like Robert. And, and it's very easy to get caught up in stuff like that. We, got, we have grandkids, and, and grandkids are fun. They are the ultimate present. You can play with them, have fun with them, and as soon as you get tired, you send them back home to their parents. What, what could be better than that? But we can get caught up in these things, can we not? Children and grandchildren and parents and children and car notes and house notes and mortgages and repairs and clothing and food and all of these things which are necessary and not bad in themselves. And yet the Bible is saying don't get so caught up in these things that you forget the times which you find yourself because one day, like it or not, ready or not, believe it or not, Christ is coming. So you've got to live in the reality, the expectancy of that time, the fact that Jesus is coming very, very soon. Take heed to yourself lest that day come upon you unexpectedly. 
There are people on earth today, even Adventists, who think they have more time than they really have. And the truth is that the last movements will move and fly with lightning rapidity, lightning speed. Look at Revelation chapter 13. We are told that this nation will one day speak as a dragon. And things are happening, ladies and gentlemen, in this world that we never believed could happen. I used to wonder, how are we going to get the word into the Soviet Union? The Soviet Union no longer exists. There's no such thing as Soviet Union. And now the gospel is in Russia. We know because we carry it there, and others carry it there. How are we going to get the gospel into some of these Arab countries, some of these countries which are so locked down and so closed up? And in the last several months, we've seen this Arab Spring take off. And, and now dictatorships that are 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years old no longer exist. And opportunities are being made for the opening of the gospel. God is going to move things and open things and open things up. And God's people have to be ready to go in with the gospel and do the work that God has called us to do. And there's not going to be a lot of time to get it done. You've got to know what you believe and be ready to give a, a reason for the hope that is within you. And so Revelation 13 says that this country will speak like a dragon, will repudi repudiate its heritage, withdraw freedoms and cherish rights from its own people, we're going to be compelled to fall in line under the pretext of either national security or some other pretext, but things are going to change and we will have to know him in whom we have to believe. We cannot draft on the faith of others. You've got to know it for yourself. You cannot have the Bible on your iPad. It's got to be in your head. Amen. Knowing our faith and being able to defend it will be crucial in these last days. One day each of us will be called to give a reason for the hope that is within us. And I pray that we will be ready on that day. The answer cannot be, I forgot my iPad, forgot my iPhone, forgot my iPad. The Bible says the word's got to be hidden in your heart right here. Amen? Amen. Everybody's going to be tested. Armageddon is the corporate cosmic culmination of the age-old struggle between good and evil, right and wrong, error versus truth. But I submit that each of us, in a greater or lesser way, will be brought to our own personal Armageddon and experiences where our stand for the right will be sorely tested and we will have to make a decision not in a closet, but before kings, priests, and princes. And my fear is that we may not be ready. My prayer is that we will all be. Ellen White indicates in The Great Controversy, page 608, that some saints are going to spend some time in jail. Some saints are going to spend some time before magistrates. Some saints are going to spend some time hidden in forests. There is coming a time, she says, when conscientious obedience to the Word of God will be treated as rebellion. Standing up for Christ is going to be treated like treason. Blinded by Satan, the parent will exercise harshness and severity towards the believing child. The master or mistress will op oppress the commandment-keeping servant. Affection will be alienated. Children will be disinherited and driven from home. The words of Paul will be literally fulfilled. All that live Christ in Christ will suffer persecution. The same trials have been 
bring it back, the same trials that have uh, been experienced by men of God in ages past, Wycliffe, Huss, Luther, Tyndale, Baxter, Wesley, urge that all doctrines be brought to the test of the what? Test of the Bible. <laughs> and will oppress the commandment-keeping servant. Affections will be alienated, children will be dis disinherited, and driven. You got to go the other way. You went back and need you to go forward. Okay. And declared that they should renounce everything which, is con which it condemned. Against these men, persecution raged with relentless fury, yet they ceased not to declare the truth. Amen? We're going to have that same test. We're going to have that same set of trials. We are going to have to fight through as they fought through. All that live godly shall suffer persecution. This is my fear, that I, we, particularly in this country, may not be ready for severe trials. Let's look at this sobering statement. I'm in Great Controversy 609. Ah, sorry, 610. 610. Persecution in its varied forms is the development of a principle which will exist as long as Satan exists and Christianity has vital power. No man can serve God without enlisting against himself the opposition of the host of darkness. So when you step out for Jesus, you pick up at least one enemy. Amen? And as long as you're on Jesus' side, he's going to be there. She says, evil men and angels will try to tempt you out. And if that doesn't work, Satan will use raw force, threats, insults, and suffering. First, he'll try to trick you out. Then he'll try to entice you out. And if that doesn't work, he'll try to just force you out. He'll use your friends. He'll use your family members. He'll use anybody he can. You know there are people in this church today, right now, who are, who are suffering silently for their faith in God. Family members have turned their back. When my mom became a Seventh-day Adventist, her family said, mm-mm, not going to have it. And they just stepped back. That's not a single incident. There are many whose family have said, we don't want you in that faith. And as long as you're there, we're not going to support you. Praise God, Christ says, when mother and father and family and friends desert you, I'll be your family. So he turns friends, family workers, family members, co-workers. We must be prepared to stand for Christ at all costs. It is hard for us to think that things will get that bad, and yet the Bible tells us it will be that way before Christ comes. We can go where we please now. We can do what we want now. We can worship as we please now. It's difficult to see a time when freedom-loving people will not be able to exercise their faith, and yet that time is coming. I read now from Great Controversy. 610. Ellen White says, so long as Jesus remains man's intercessor in the sanctuary above, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is felt by rulers and people. Praise God, Christ is holding things back now. It still, it or he still controls to some extent the laws of the land were it not for these laws, the condition of the world would be much worse than it now is. While many of our rulers are active agents of Satan, amen, amen, the lifestyle say that, God also has his agents among the leading men of the nation, amen. Devil's got something in there. So does God. Ellen White says that uh, the Advent message of 1840 to 1844 was the first angel's message. 
She called it a glorious manifestation of the power of God. It had its flaws, it had its mistakes, but it turned men's hearts towards heaven. Then one of my favorite passage, passages, Great Controversy, page 611. This is something that God's people need to hold on to. The great work of the gospel, amen? The great work of the gospel is not to close with less of a manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. Isn't that a powerful statement? I want to be part of that. I, I, don't, I don't know how much longer I have on this on planet Earth. I'm not an old man. I don't feel like an old man. Hopefully I don't act like an old man, Pastor. But I want to be a part of that loud cry. I want to be a part of that great manifestation. I, you know, it's funny. When I, when I was call portering, I'm not a good call porter. If I, if I had to live selling books, I would starve to death. Can't do it. People have certain talents. I, selling books door to door is not my thing. I tried it. Had to do it in school before we could get our degree. So I spent a summer. I, I, first of all, I was starved to death. I'm a sucker. I use that term for every story. I want to say you book, you tell me I don't have the money, I'm going to give you the book. Well, that means you got to take the, the money out of your pocket. And I remember once going up on this, this porch, there was a lady there, and um, I wanted to get a, 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 I'd given her the book, and she said, come back next week to get the money. And I came back the next week, and she had an attack cat on her porch. This wasn't an attack. This was an attack cat. Big, thick, furry, mountain lion looking cat. And as I went up on the porch, it would raise up and, and just, just, this was an attack cat. I, I've never seen a cat that vicious. And I said, Lord, you got you to gotta get me in that house because I need this money. And my, my, my you know, your, your, your group leader says, you got to collect this week. And this, this uh, just hissing and just an attack cat. I said, Lord, how am I going to, how am I going to, you know, this, this, this cat is back in a grown man, a college student, basketball player, six foot tall, 170 plus pounds, and this little ball of fur is backing me down. And I, I had to wait the cat out. Finally, he got bored and went away. I sat there an hour waiting for that cat to leave. I said, I, I will starve to death trying to sell books for the Lord. And yet, that text says God is going to send a power to finish the gospel like he did on the day of Pentecost. I want that power. I want to be part of that. I want to see miracles wrought like never before. I, I, want, I want to be there when, when the earth is lighted with the glory of the, the third angel's message when men and women hear and know and understand to keep the Sabbath day. I want to be, I want to see that with my own eyes. More than that, I want to be part of that. The work is not going to close with less of a manifestation than when it began. I want to be a part of that. But Satan will not stand idle. He's not going to stand by and see us work unfeathered, or unfettered rather, we are going to experience a time of unfettered evil as never before that will attend the unfettered power of the Lord. I'm in Great Controversy 613 now. Great Controversy 613. As angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in ruin. More terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. This is crucial. Satan's going to throw this world into chaos in one last attempt to trip up the people of God. You know, I ran out of time the other night, didn't get a chance to say it. You need to read Early writings, I think it's page 147, where Ellen White gives this vision. She saw Satan. She saw him sitting with his, his, his head resting in his hand, just thinking. 
And she describes the vision. She says he is a large-framed angel. She says his skin hang loosely, hung loosely from, from his face. He, she says he still bears the marks of a superior being because he is an angel. But she says you can see what sin and evil has done, how it has carved itself into his features. She said he was thinking about Christians. And then she says an evil, satanic smile came across his face. And she said that's the smile that he gets just before he claims another saint. Just before he destroys another soul, that's the smile that he gets. Don't think that Satan is going to stand idly by and watch God do his work. In Great Controversy, page 620, she says, Satan leads many to believe that God would overlook their unfaithfulness in the minor affairs of life. But the Lord shows in his dealings with Jacob that he will in no wise sanction or tolerate evil. All who endeavor to excuse or conceal their sins and permit them to remain upon the books of heaven unconfessed and unforgiven will be overcome by Satan. Now, I want to put my finger there. You hear what she's saying? If you think you can sneak by with a little something, you're opening the door to your own defeat. Every sin must be confessed. Every sin must be forsaken. Little things and big things must be put away and we must be spotless if we're going to stand in that final battle. It is, it is Satan's plan to think, God's not that particular about little stuff, so I get mad and blow up. I'm a Christian 99% of the time. I'm fine when all must be surrendered to him, even the little things. And if we don't check the little things, we are opening the door to our own defeat. Now let me pick it up where I left off. The more exalted their position, that's me, that's Pastor Lo McCain, that's Pastor Steve, that's every deacon, every deaconess, that's John Dinsey, that's Danny Shelton, that's Molly Steenson, that's Shelley Quinn, that's, that's Jim Gilly. That's the General Conference president. That's everybody who is in a position of trust and honor. The more exalted their position and the more honorable, I'm sorry, the more exalted their profession and the more honorable the position which they hold, the more grievous is their course in the sight of God. Huh? So when you get to be pastor, elder, deacon, church treasurer, the higher your position, the more God calls upon you to follow him. And the more sure the triumph of their great adversary. So if you've got a high position, you've got to be closer to God because Satan's coming after you. Those who delay a preparation for the day of God cannot obtain it in the time of trouble. When the winds blow and the storm comes, it's too late to start working on your character. You do it now so that when the wind comes and the storms blow, your character is already set and fixed on Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And the more God gives you, the more he expects from you. Huh? Those who delay a preparation for the day of God cannot obtain it in the time of trouble or at any subsequent time. Last line. The case of all such is what? Hopeless. Hopeless. They used to say, get it now while a getting is good. Get it now while it's possible. Because if you wait till the time of trouble, it's going to be too late. 
So you, key why, you see why I keep saying, examine yourself, examine yourself, examine yourself, examine yourself. Take a look at your own works and make sure of where you stand. Now time is getting away, so I've got to make a, fa a couple of quick turns. Revelation 16, 13. Revelation 16, 13. I'm not going to read it all, just refer to it. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. I cannot read the text anymore without thinking about my pastor and unclean spirits, but I saw unclean spirits like frogs out of the mouth of dragon, beast, false prophet, Satan, paganism, spiritualism, and its ecclesiastical arm and apostate Protestantism. The world is whipped up into a frenzy for the spiritual showdown called Armageddon. It is a spiritual showdown between the forces of good and evil. So don't look for tanks and guns and battles in the Middle East. This is a showdown, right and wrong, good and bad, good versus evil. There may be and will be a physical manifestation because people are involved. Don't look for a rebuilding of Jerusalem. Don't look for a regathering. Look for a battle between good and evil. And in rapid succession, we see a number of things, a number of things happening. Seven vials, seven bowls being poured out. The dissolution of Babylon, Babylon the Great. The second great call, that call of the second, uh, the second angel, repeated in Revelation 18, um, just like it was in Revelation 14. And then we move to Revelation 19, and we see a great multitude called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Here's where I want to pick up the story. At the coming of the Lord, there will be four classes of people, and I've got just five minutes to get this done. There will be, first of all, righteous dead. When Christ comes, you're going to fall in one of the four classes. You'll be righteous dead, unrighteous dead, unrighteous living, or righteous living. Three of those are taken care of in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself, doing it from memory, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, dead in Christ, that's righteous dead, will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, New King James in on the screen, my head is a King James head, so you'll forgive me. When I did my memory, it was in Kings. I think it like that too, Pastor Loma, okay? You know, you, you start out learning it, King James, and it's hard to get that King James out of, your, out of your brain. So we've dealt with righteous dead, righteous living. We're going where? Going with Jesus. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 deals with the, the, the third class, unrighteous living. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with his breath and with the brightness of his coming. So there's going to be a group of people who are not righteous, who are not ready, and don't want to see Christ coming. They will be slain by the brightness of his coming. Paul is targeting in that particular text, actually when you look at it, he's targeting a religious system. But when you read the ensuing verses, it goes for those unrighteous living also. So if you're righteous living, you are running to Jesus, but you've got to get in line behind the righteous dead because they rise first. If you are unrighteous and living, you will be slain by the brightness of his coming. That leaves just one group. That's the unrighteous dead. You follow me? That's where the story is picked up in Revelation where it says the rest of the dead, we're in Revelation 20, our reading for the beginning of the message, lived not again until the thousand years were past. Time does not afford for me to give you the complete scenario, save to say one of the things we're going to do during that thousand years is look over the books and ratify and certify that all the things that God said and did were just. Then the new earth is coming back down here because this is going to be the permanent home. At that point, the rest of the dead 
are resurrected. And Satan goes about to deceive. They think they can take the city because of their numbers and because there's no reason for them not to because there's absolutely no Holy Spirit working now. This is under the total control of Satan. And then the Bible says fire comes down and destroys them. And ladies and gentlemen, just that quick, it's over. It is. Just that quick. And then there will be a new heaven and a new earth in which dwells righteousness and sin will never rise again. It's done once and for all. Amen. And it'll never come back again. I long for that time. I long for a time when everybody can get along. When there's no anger, no malice, no hate, no temper tantrums, no lying, no stealing, no covetousness, no death, no dying, no aging, and no more tears. It'll all be over. We'll be with Christ. And I don't know about you, I got a million questions to ask him. So you may have to get in line behind me. I got a lot to ask him. But I've got a million years to ask him. Amen? Amen. And there will be truly war no more. Are you excited about that day? Yes. Are you preparing for that day? Are you doing all you can for that day? It's coming.